Welcome everybody. Getting started shortly. Normally you would have been able to come into the museum and hear that song playing and many others, but still ain't no stopping us now. We're here. Thank you for joining us. Um, and good evening and welcome to Regarding Ebony and Jet. My name is Michelle Dezember. I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement at the Contemporary Art Museum St. Louis. And despite the weather and our unexpected moved virtual, I feel so much joy to be together with you all tonight. Tonight's program is presented in collaboration with the Center for the Study of Race, Ethnicity, and Equity at Washington University in St. Louis. And I am so grateful, so grateful to my partners here, Hedy Lee, Tila Naguse, and Johnny Wu. You made the process of crafting this event, including all of the pivoting, filled with love and mutual care. Cam is also grateful to be sponsoring this program in partnership with the Missouri Humanities Council and with the support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Regarding as a program series in which we invite a look at art on view through another lens. And so tonight we're presenting a community celebration on the publications Ebony and Jet for the role that they have played in artist Lorna Simpson's collage series. If we were at CAM right now, we would be pointing you to see our Street Views exhibition. You would have seen it as you came in. It plays two beautiful animated works by Simpson from dusk until midnight on the museum's front facade. Um, and actually just for another, another week um, until we close our, our exhibition season and get ready for our spring summer. Instead, we get to enjoy a virtual presentation from CAM's assistant curator, Misa Jeffries, in just a moment. In addition to thanks to the CRE2 team and our sponsors, I would like to give a warm welcome and thank you to our invited contributors, Adrian Davis, Raven Mirage Lloyd, Christopher Tinzen, and most of all, I would like to give a special thanks to our very special guest who's providing the groundwork for our evening, Bridget Cooks. My life changed 20 years ago when I was a student and I'm not going to cry. <laughs> My life changed 20 years ago when I was a student in Professor Cook's African Americans in Photography class. I trace my love of art, museum work, and so, so much more to her brilliance. And I'm so happy that she's here. Well, she's here in St. Louis, but in a hotel. And I think this is just a rain check to bring her back again. Um, I'd also like to say a thank you to the wonderful Lois Conley who participated in a conversation with Bridget through CRE2 yesterday, and I'm happy you're with us again today too. So before we really jump in, I would love to give an overview and some housekeeping for how tonight will run. So bear with me while I share my screen. Mm -mm -mm. So for tonight, we um, will start with Misa giving a wonderful presentation to help introduce us to the works that are um, on view at the Contemporary Art Museum by Lorna Simpson. Uh, and then we're gonna hear from Bridget Cooks uh, to provide really the grounding and deeper context for approximately 20 minutes. Then I'll invite our invited contributors to the spotlight for five minute contributions. And then we're actually gonna open up the floor to anybody here who would like to uh, respond to the question, what does Ebony and Jet mean to you? Um, so you'll notice this is a meeting format instead of a webinar because we wanted you to be, we really wanted this to feel like a celebration, like something that was participatory. Um, I learned a lot from the talk yesterday as I always have from Bridget about how important it really is for museums to acknowledge not only like the limits of our knowledge, but to call people in to contribute to um, a fuller understanding of the role that art plays in our lives by, by listening. So we would love to hear what you have to say about what does Ebony and Jet mean to you? Some virtual participation tips that can help us. Uh, you should be muted when you come in, but if you could help us by staying on mute since we have a, a larger crowd. Um, live transcript, I believe is en enabled. My friends at CRA2 who are far better at virtual programming will probably help me with that if not, um, in case you'd like to follow along with a live transcript. And um, when it comes time to call in our audience participation, you'll see that there's a button called reactions, which I'll just highlight here with my cursor. 
you should see a button that says reactions at the bottom of your Zoom screen that gives you the option to raise your hand. Uh, and that'll give a, a cue to us that we should keep an eye out for you and spotlight you so that you can share your contribution of what does Ebony and Jet mean to you. All right, I'd also like to direct you to um, an art making activity that we would have been hosting on site by our wonderful CJ Mitchell. She's our, our uh, community access manager and she designed this really great art activity that was inspired by Lorna's work. Um, I'll drop the link in our chat and it's a really great way just to um, bring Lorna's work into your, um, into your home in this case. We would have loved to do it with you together, but um, come check that out. Um, CJ really did a wonderful job in, um, in translating Lorna's work into a project that you can realize yourself. So without further ado, I'm going to um, turn things over to CAMS assistant curator, Misa Jeffries, to show us a little bit about Lorna Simpson's work at the museum. Great, thanks, Michelle. Um, let me go ahead and just share my screen really fast. Okay, I'm going to have this. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Misa. I'm the assistant curator at CAM, and I had the great pleasure of working with our chief curator, Wes Nal Kaderi, to organize the exhibition Lorna Simpson Heads. This exhibition is part of our outdoor video projection series called Street Views, which is presented on the front of the building every evening from dusk until midnight. Unfortunately, since we aren't able to be on site today, I'm assuming probably many of you have not seen the video yet. Um, so I wanted to take a moment to just share some documentation of the exhibition. The show consists of two digital animations by the artist Lorna Simpson, Blue Love made in 2020 and Redhead from 2018. They're each eight seconds long and they loop continuously all night. Let me play this for you. Okay, I'm going to switch my screen now to my presentation, share a little bit about Lorna and her practice and the exhibition. So Lorna Simpson is an incredibly influential artist who rose up in the 1980s as part of a generation of artists who incorporated conceptual ideas into photography to challenge the way that we assume images and language are neutral. Her powerful photographic and text-based works raise questions about the nature of representation, identity, gender, race, memory, and history. In 2010, Simpson began to extend these concerns into the medium of collage. Her ebony collage series began in 2010 and is ongoing, and her jet collages were made between 2012 and 2018. In each of these bodies of work, the artist sources images from ebony and jet issues from the 1950s to the 1970s, which she finds at flea markets and vintage shops. Simpson explains that her interest in these found images came from, quote, a discovery I made of these old ebony magazines belonging to my grandmother. I found them really satisfying to look at because they're so contextual. For me, the images harken back to my childhood but are also a lens through which to see the past 50 years in American history. She goes on to say, as I was looking for different images or reading through the text in these magazines, I became completely fascinated by the perspective, who it's written for, the audience, the way things are written, the historical context, end of quote. Ebony and Jet were founded and published for decades by the black owned Johnson Publishing Company. The magazines focus on subjects of lifestyle, culture and politics from an African American perspective. This was the point of view, especially in the mid century and still to this day, underrepresented, misrepresented or even ignored in mainstream media. Yet these publications are significant markers of a really important yet turbulent era in the US, which included the civil rights movement, racial violence, the assassination of political and social leaders, and the war in Vietnam. So since 2010, Simpson has been accessing this rich material from Jet and Ebony to make her collages. 
In these works, the artist typically foregrounds the head of the figure in close up and cropped, placing attention on the subject's face and hair. In reference to her extreme cropping of the figure, she says, quote, the notion of fragmentation, especially of the body, is prevalent in our culture, and it's reflected in my works. We're fragmented not only in terms of how society regulates our bodies, but also in the way we think about ourselves, end of quote. So as you can see in these examples, the artist often embellishes the figures with watercolor, creating these shimmering flame-like hairdos. In the past few years, she began to expand her collage practice by animating and bringing to life the 2D works, transforming them into these beautiful videos. The watercolor elements swirl and eddy almost as if the paint is still wet, inviting you to decipher or interpret these four shot tests. By incorporating figures from Ebony and Jet, these history-laden documents, and reanimating them through video, Simpson is threading together American life across time and place. Her images invite us to rethink the ways we interpret and create meaning as we engage with subjects of different races and genders. There's also a real joy to be gleaned from the collages, just as there is a joy in flipping through the pages of Jet and Ebony. There is almost a tenderness with which Simpson adorns her subjects. Their billowing hair perhaps connects them to nature. We think about flowing water or flames of fire, especially in an image like this one. The gaze of the figure draws you in, sometimes meeting your own sightline and other times directing you toward an implied space outside the frame of the image. The figures have power and hold space. I'll leave you with this last quote by the poet Elizabeth Alexander, who has written about Simpson's collages saying, quote, Black women's heads of hair are galaxies unto themselves, solar systems, moonscapes, volcanic interiors, sinuous and cloudy and fully alive. Watercolor is the perfect medium for Simpson here because of how it holds light and appears to be translucent, but it's also a wash, a shadow cast over what we cannot know in these women, end of quote. So I'll leave it at that brief overview of the exhibition and Lorna's work, but I do encourage everyone to come to the museum or at least drive by at night to see street views before it closes, as Michelle said, closes on February 27th. So we have just about 10 days until um, it will be gone. So thank you. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Michelle. Thank you, Misa. I appreciate that context. And I am excited now to um, turn things over to our special guest, Bridget Cooks. Um, to give a little introduction to Bridget, Bridget R. Cooks is Associate Professor in the Department of Art History and the Department of African American Studies at the University of California, Irvine. Her research focuses on African American artists, Black visual culture, and museum criticism. She is the author of the seminal book, Exhibiting Blackness, African Americans and the American Art Museum. Cooks has worked in museum education and curated many, many exhibitions, including Grafton Tyler Brown, Exploring California, Ernie Barnes, A Retrospective, and the currently nationally touring exhibition, The Black Index. Bridget, I very happily turn things over to you. All right, I'm going to share my screen and um, welcome everybody um, for being here. I know that we all wanted to be together, especially when we started hearing the music, um, but it's great that we can do this. So um, I hope that wherever you are, you're safe and, um, and doing well and able to have a little reprieve from everyday life to, um, to join in the celebration. So thank you um, to my friend and colleague, Michelle December, who's Director of Learning and Engagement and uh, Chief Curator Wasan al Kuderi, um, and everyone at um, Camp St. Louis who's been um, incredibly generous and uh, genuine in my um, brief visit to St. Louis um, this week. I also wanna thank my new colleagues at the um, Department of African American Studies at WashU. African and African American Studies at WashU, and the study of race, ethnicity, and equity also at WashU. So I'm just going to give um, an overview about the theme of our event today. And I know we could all go on and on about what Ebony and Jet means to us. And I know some of my esteemed colleagues have some very personal um, stories to share. So I'm not going to um, take up too much of um, 
of our time. But I did want to think about, you know, what has brought us together on this occasion, this nocturnal presentation of um, Lorna Simpson's uh, head shown through the street views that um, Misa has talked to us about. Um, and it provides this occasion for us to really reflect on these publications that have been really ubiquitous uh, for many of us. They've been in our homes, they've been topics of conversations, they've been in our beauty shops, <laughs> our barber shops, our churches, the back of our cars, um, you know, they're, um, they're part of uh, a kind of visual culture of black life in America. So um, this is a time where we can really start thinking about how these pictures have functioned in our personal lives, but also in a larger um, cultural role. So I wanted to show just some pictures and it was hard to narrow it down, but you know, for the sake of time I did, um, just some pictures from um, Ebony and Jet. I, I know many of us are, are very familiar with these issues, and, um, but not everybody is. So thinking about um, Lorna Simpson looking through this archive from her grandmother, right? I mean, she's one of several contemporary African-American artists who have mined these archives, personal and also um, even in libraries um, and official archives to find these issues of Ebony and Jet from the mid to late 20th century as source materials for art. And the magazines are certainly where I think most of us would turn first if we were seeking out aspirational images and idealized images of black masculinity um, and in one category. So what I'm showing you here, this is a, um, uh, aspirational photograph, uh, like a fantasy, fantasy photograph of MJ made in 1985 by a Chicago-based artist named Nathan Wright, who was asked to uh, approximate what he thought Michael Jackson would look like in the year 2000. So it's very interesting. I mean, I mean, you know, Nathan Wright is an artist in his own right, but it's so interesting to think about this kind of futuristic um, project. And then for us looking back now, 22 years ago, we have a very different story to tell about Michael Jackson, particularly how much he did not look like this at all um, at the time. But Ebony is, was a place and is a place where you could go back and you could have those kind of fantasies about the future based on the present. Um, this issue, uh, going back in time from 1952, I just pulled this to show um, some diversity um, in Ebony magazine. Um, this woman is a black model, um, but she's in this kind of, um, you know, woven hat that you would find or imagine that you would, uh, would find in the Pacific Islands. Um, and then it's also an interesting cover to look at because we're looking at these different headlines that are asking us to buy the magazine, um, none of them have anything to do with the woman who's on the cover. Um, so I'm a woman again about uh, Gladys Bentley, who we know as a black lesbian um, cross-dressing um, singer um, who had this uh, medical procedure to try to make her a woman again. Um, so there's more insight about that. Um, Negro millionaires in Texas and the brainiest man in baseball. Okay, so there's a whole variety. There's kind of something for everyone and, and usually more than you asked for um, when it came to Ebony Magazine. But the, I think the real catch here visually is um, this mostly nude woman <laughs> who um, is this idealized image of black femininity. And then we also turn to Ebony for um, ideal pictures of the black family, right? And I know um, as a child, I would look at these and I was always looking at hairstyles and we're gonna talk much more about that. Clothing styles, um, what I would need to look like to be a black model, you know? And that perfect family, you know, it's the heterosexual couple, both parents are black and the kids are black, um, you know, with the, um, one boy and one girl. Um, and then we also look, of course, to Ebony for Black Love. So this is February, Black History Month and the Month for Lovers. 
Um, and so we see Devon Franklin and Making Good on this cover, a bit more recent from 2013. And so um, Ebony has uh, over the years had something for everyone, but I think, you know, in some ways, sometimes the articles might seem a little more lighthearted. Um, and um, on the other hand, they really have been, Jet and, and Ebony have been resources for us to find validation of Black life, Black relationships, um, and Black success in different forms. So um, I also want to focus a bit on the advertisements because these are um, images that I think many of us will find familiar and have been really inspirational, um, particularly for Black artists. So we have a focus in Ebony and Jet on, again, the financially su successful Black American people, uh, particularly through the magazine's features on Black entertainers and music and film and television, but through advertisements like this of Black men and women in love and in love with their cool cigarettes and their cool aid um, and black children in mass with their McDonald's Happy Meals. There's um, a woman that I met who um, runs the store, owns the store um, downstairs in the hotel where I'm staying and her kids were in a McDonald's ad in Ebony Magazine and she tried to find it because I really wanted to show it today and she wasn't able to find it. But, you know, just talking to people um, about Ebony Jet, everyone has a story and I think as we'll see, um, in a few moments, very personal stories where you're actually represented in the pages. So I, this is blurry because the technology has changed so much, but I, this is just a one minute advertisement that I just wanted to share with you. It's a commercial uh, from Ebony Magazine um, from 1988. And this gives us an idea about how Ebony uh, marketed itself to its subscribers. Dear Ebony, I would like to thank you personally for your article, Mothers and Daughters. Over the years, Ebony Magazine has received some pretty wonderful fan mail. In today's society, black children need a good role model. Month after month, Ebony's success stories become your success stories. Thanks for that How to Start Your Own Business article. I've learned some tips to help me get started. For a full year of Ebony plus two free issues, just call 1-800-255-9500 right now. We'll bill your American Express, Visa, or MasterCard for only $12.50. That's less than a dollar a month. Call 1-800-255-9500 today and give your family the Ebony advantage. I am really looking forward to trying that brown sugar pound cake. Well, thanks, Ebony, for enriching our lives in so many ways. But I yes. enjoy Ebony's alternative perspectives on current and historical issues, as well as just plain interesting reading. Ebony, for your life and your times, for people just like you. Okay. I mean, that says it all <laughs> in so many ways. And you can see how it appeals and how it's, you know, it's a fantasy image. At least it was for my family, but... Um, I think it also really did validate our situation and, and gave us hope for where we could be, right? I mean, it, it, it focused so much on uh, the dreaminess of being part of the Black middle class, you know? Um, I think for many of us, Ebony has functioned as really a picture magazine, with, and with some exceptions. The magazine stories were less about the news of the day or political reports, and more about notable figures, Negro first and beauty twins. Uh, and the same can be said for Jet Magazine, which had its own specific group of dedicated readers because of the beauty of the week pictorials of black women in uh, bombshells in bikinis and often just a few sentences about their professional aspirations. The most well-known exception to these regular offerings came in 1955 with this issue that featured a group of photographs that I am not going to show. Um, taken by Jet staff photographer David Jackson of Emmett Till. And Jet's publication of Till's lynched body was a bold and unfor unforgettable revelation that had impact worldwide. Um, and many say, and I certainly would agree, that the publication of these photographs in Jet magazine helped to lead to um, the blossoming of the civil rights movement. So over, over several years, Jet published 
follow-up articles about Emmett Till's mother, Mamie Till, and continued special issues about anti-Black violence um, in the South in particular, um, and then specifically in Mississippi. So it's interesting when we're looking at this cover, we're not seeing anything about Emmett Till, but this is uh, the cover issue. Um, and there are these other bits of information, right? These other headlines that are drawing us into um, looking at the magazine, but this became, I would say, its most famous issue. Um, I just wanted to draw your attention since I mentioned the follow-up, you know, what happened to Emmett Till's mother, right? So this is five years after that first publication with the photographs, um, but here you can get a follow-up and, and see how she started her new life. Um, and then this is an example of a focus, um, particularly on Mississippi. So these were not usual um, for Jet Magazine. I'd say even less usual for Ebony Magazine. Um, but you did have these more hard hitting stories um, that were really shocking to many non-Black readers um, who got their hands on them. So I, I would say that because of the beauty and, and the tragedy, the humor and community reporting that was offered by Ebony and Jet, you know, the magazines have really endured for generations and its legacy has become part of our collective identity. So Simpson, as Misha offered us so generously, is one of several artists whose engagement with this archive has produced new images that reflect on the pictorial past. And I'm just showing um, a few, just three more from um, Lorna Simpson. This is from her series, Earth and Sky, where she has these wonderful um, gems geological growths, minerals, crystals um, that replace the hair of black women. This is my personal favorite, Man in Yellow um, from 2011. I love that look. Um, and um, yeah, it's that kind of little bit of side eye, but also like this um, bedazzling blonde at the same time. The ombre hair, the ombre roots going on. Daisy Chain, super sexy black woman with, uh, you know, all of this activity. And, um, you know, part of it, I think, is an extension of their imagination, the way that the color is like on their skull and then extends into space. And it helps us think about the personalities of these people, their fantasies, and all of the things in particular that wigs promise you that you will transform yourself, right? That wigs in mid 20th century were called transformations, right? And that that's something that Lorna Simpson and also another artist, Ellen, Ellen Gallagher, really hone in on to make their imaginative works. Um, Ellen Gallagher, uh, another African-American artist, she lives in Rotterdam and New York. Um, this is work that she did that precedes Simpson series, and this is called Deluxe. And in this work, she, she makes collages. Um, she has images that she takes from um, Ebony, Our World, and Sepia, which are two other um, Black-owned magazines for Black people. Um, and I'll show you some. There are 60 panels. And I just wanna show you um, some of what she has done to make this work. And one thing she does that's different from what Simpson did later is she uh, maintains some of the text and she cuts out text and replaces it with different texts to tell a, a different kind of story than you would see in the original uh, magazine. So um, the man who kept Harlem cool, uh, maybe they just sat under his hair. I'm not exactly sure. Maybe this is like storm with the ice, um, but she's using this plasticine. It's a three-dimensional clay that's um, put on top of the paper. Um, another example of how she's working really imaginatively with hair and clay and um, also um, uh, altering the image itself. You can look at her eyes and the outline of the woman's shoulders and decollage there. Um, and then the things that she's doing um, with the rest of the page, adding these other people's um, faces and blocking out some of the text, All right? Handmade salon styled real hair attachments, satisfaction guaranteed or money back. And it's all about in this article, or advertisement, Black women needing to change their hair to be attractive to Black men. 
and black men are also modified. Um, there are many ads for um, skin lightening cream and um, uh, pomade you put on your hair. And I think that Gallagher is um, interested in making these fantasy images, but I think part of what she's doing is also critical of this desire to transform oneself to be beautiful or quote, um, really proud of your hair. So this is Mr. Terrific. Um, everyone must like this, Isaac. <laughs> this is from the series. So she's doing something else, cutting out um, Isaac Hayes from the magazine and then adding her own embellishments. Another artist who's been inspired by Ebony and Jet is um, the great Hank Willis Thomas, a contemporary artist who's, who's deeply interested in exploring advertisement. This is his work uh, that you walk into. It's really a large installation called Black is Beautiful, 1953 to 2008. And what he's done here is cut out all of those beauty of the week images that I didn't show you, but now I'm showing you them all together. Um, there's 3,000 of them in his installation. And here's a bit of a close-up of what those look like. So I would say that um, here, Thomas makes a compelling case for Black beauty through these very titillating images of women. And this work may also encourage us to ask if this is the only way that Black is beautiful while thinking about, at the same time, the value of Jet Magazine's weekly profiles on Black women who were not featured or considered valuable and beautiful um, regularly or at all in other kinds of periodicals. Um, Thomas tested viewers' knowledge through his branded and unbranded series, and I'm showing you here a few examples from unbranded that asked viewers uh, to engage in some kind of total recall, right? It's like you see these images and they're familiar, and then you try to remember, try to guess what the products are that are in the advertising. Um, this is caramel, cocoa, butter, honey, uh, lover. Sorry, let me try that again. This is a little bit of a tongue twister. Caramel, cocoa, butter, honey, lover. You're like no other from Unbranded. Okay, OJ Dingo. I remember he was selling Samsonites when I was a kid. Uh, and this is the Johnson family also from Unbranded. But I think that beyond what seems like a kind of immediate test or a fun visual trick in his work, Thomas helps us to think about how the black body is represented for financial gain and corporate sales. Right? He really draws their attention to the markability of the black body. What is being sold in this image? You know, either we remember or we have to take a guess and it's hard to see the visual cues to understand what is being sold here with this family. Um, another artist, uh, the great portraitist, uh, Maria Moore, Rizal of Oshun from uh, 2012. So with this beautiful young woman, we also see um, Say Magazine and Jet as just staples in the family home, in the domestic space. Um, and I think I'm almost ending. Uh, I wanted to show this by Lyle Ashton Harris, who's a, a great photographer, um, a very important photographer. And this is, um, uh, a photograph called Elmina Number One from 2008. So here we're looking at this man, uh, Ghanaian man um, in Ghana um, at the Elmina port, and um, he has his ebony shirt on. So it's interesting to think about the presence in ebony and, uh, and jet in the Black diaspora. And, um, and you do wonder what this man thinks about ebony or what he thinks about Black Americans and maybe what the role of ebony was in his life. Um, and this will be my last image, um, also by Hank Willis Thomas, you know, just putting jet in that uh, font and then people in the people font immediately, I think we get images of the magazine and, and the difference between readers of jet and readers of people. I think that there's some overlap, but there's definitely a different um, target audience um, and two different communities, I think, that um, are really invested in these um, different kinds of periodicals. So artists like Thomas, um, Lyle Ashton Harris, 
uh, Lorna Simpson, Ellen Gallagher, I think are real visionaries, but also cultural critics in a way for us to turn to, to think about the resonance of these publications in our lives. So I will turn it over um, to my esteemed colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Yeah. Appreciate you so much. And <laughs> like I said, we have a rain check for you when um, the weather is better for you to come back and not okay. be in the On God Hotel when we get to talk about to. art. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So I would love to continue our program by calling in some of our contributors. Um, thank you for the help with the spotlights to my friends, Tila and Johnny. Um, I'm gonna call in Adrian Davis next. Um, Adrian Davis is William M. Van Cleve Professor of Law at Washington University in St. Louis, the founder and co-director of the Law and Culture Initiative and Professor of Organizational Behavior and Leadership at the Olin Business School. Believe it or not, and I'm sure you do believe it, that is not the full list, um, but there is one other important distinction I'd like to add, which is that Adrian is an art collector, art lover, and art supporter. So with that, I turn it over to you, Adrian. And actually, let me, um, I will, we can unpin me, but hopefully it will still work for me to share my screen um, for your slides. Okay. Great, perfect, thank you so much. Um, um, and just one quick edit. Um, I founded the Center for the Study of, of Race, Ethnicity and Equity and was the founding co-director, um, but I uh, stepped aside last year and the current co-directors are Hetty Lee and um, Mike and Billy Acree, two amazing colleagues. And they're the people who get um, all the credit along with the Contemporary Art Museum for, uh, for this evening. Um, I want to thank the Contemporary Art Museum and Washington University Center for the Study of Race, Ethnicity and Equity, which I will now abbreviate as CAM and CRE2 respectively. So I want to thank both of them for this incredible opportunity. Um, Dr. Bridget Cooks for her expertise and brilliant talk and Lorna Simpson for the inspiration. And first I wanna say that as much as I appreciate CAMS and CRE2's nimble pivot to being virtual um, this evening, I was like, I'm sure many of you were, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, devastated that the weather prevented us from being together in person. I was so looking forward to being in community with people for whom Ebony and Jet meant something, who experienced it as a glossy marker of home and within our homes of dignity, political struggle and celebration of black life and accomplishment and achievement, as did I and my family. I was especially looking forward to the fashion I knew folks were going to sport. So I am rocking my Ebony Junior inspired Afro puffs, a little grayer than they used to be. Um, but if you were a black child in the 1970s when I was, then your parents might have subscribed to not only Ebony and Jet, but also Ebony uh, Junior. Um, and you can just show the second slide as well. Um, or it might've been in your doctor's or dentist's office, or as Bridget points out, the barbershop or beauty salon. So all power to Sunny and Honey and her gorgeous puffs, which I refer to sometimes as my superpower. Sometimes the most fruitful conversations come not from telling, but from asking. And hence our hosts, Cam and Sari, two seemingly simple question, what do Ebony and Jet mean to you, has provoked an outpouring of memories, some of which I was um, honored to capture on my Facebook page. I will quickly, quickly share some. Lori White, the president of DePaul University, wrote that her father's article toward a black psychology that launched the discipline of black psychology was published in Ebony Magazine and the Jackson Five, she reports one on the cover of that issue. Her father claimed that when the Dean questioned his tenure file, he said more people read his article at Ebony than all the publications combined in academic journals by other faculty in his department. Ebony and Jet were how we received and shared our news, our modern day underground railroad. That's from Lori White, Dr. Lori White. One black friend about 10 years younger than me said, wow, we grew up in an all white college town. Those magazines were a lifeline to black people, music, style, culture, politics, and a wasteland. We subscribed to both and everyone poured over them. Nor was the impact <clears throat> limited to black folk. A South Asian colleague wrote from Florida, Ebony meant the people I looked, uh, the people that I looked like were valued and important. After the racism and colorism of white and South Asian society, it was a revelation. 
And finally, my sister's father-in-law, a self-described quote, white boy in Iowa during the 1940s and early 1950s wrote, it was the only way for me to get a glimpse into this exotic world I longed for, Eartha Kitt, my first crush. What Johnson Publishing achieved with Ebony and Jet magazines was of course, pathbreaking publications with a mission of celebrating and reporting black life without pathology. The seemingly simple principle of capturing in glossy, beautiful detail, the richness and elegance, and as Dr. Cooks points out, fantasies of black life without pathologizing it was actually wrapped in those glossy pages of respectability of fierce resistance to white supremacy. And Jet too, with its at times tabloid-esque photos, and I'm thinking here in the 1970s of how black men that I, I, I was a little girl, but black men would joke privately within my earshot about the multiple ice pick murder pictures in Jet. I don't know if you all remember those. Um, and it's a beautifully curvy Jet Beauty of the Week also served up the richness of black life without pathology. Um, next slide, please, Michelle. Although Ebony was clearly a liberal publication, it did not discriminate against more conservative black, tradition, black traditions. Hence, it celebrated my father's achievement as the second black special agent in charge of an FBI office. And yes, that's me on the sofa sitting on, um, sitting on the left, kneeling there. Um, and although it masked the potentially upsetting politics, you know, of, of celebrating an African American in the FBI with what Dr. Cook, I think very appropriately called the fantasy of normative middle-class family life. Ebony and Jet served not only as publications, but as progenitors for complex genealogies that connect me and my 10 year old Afro puffs with leading black scholars who published their work and read the, read the magazines and also gave white people yearning to escape from the racial supremacist cages awaiting them a peep into something beyond. We might think of this meaning as a common genealogical tree of visual representation, one in which generations of black folks can locate ourselves wherever and whenever we encountered it. In addition to this genealogical tree of representation on which we can locate ourselves, we might think also as a sort of narrative or discursive solidarity, as in the sense that we all grew up <clears throat> with not only common visual references, but with other common narratives of Black life that Ebony and Jet provided. And I won't rehearse those because I think Dr. Cooks did such a brilliant um, job of, of sharing some of those with us. This memory of a collective consciousness and a visual discurse of solidarity coalesced for me in 2013 when I was fortunate enough to buy one of Lorna Simpson's early ebony heads. Um, next slide, please, Michelle. In 2013, I was at Art Basel in Miami and a St. Louis connection had managed to garner an audience with a grand denizen gallerist who had some of the first iterations of Lorna Simpson's heads. The gallerist explained to me that Simpson, at that time already an unparalleled pathbreaking photographer and someone known for working with uh, more classic photographic archives, was doing something stunning. She was pivoting from her established practice to becoming a collage artist and in the process developing new, car, new archives and artistic practices. Her new archive, of course, was Ebony and later Jet Ma Magazine, both of which I take to be such a loving homage by one of the foremost Black fine arts photographers, Simpson, to the more commercial photographers whose work populated Ebony and Jet and laid the visual dimension of our common genealogical tree and discursive solidarity. There were several heads available for purchase and I mused over the array of vibrant skin tones and jewel toned hair, two of which you see um, on the um, see outside of the Contemporary Art Museum. And I do encourage you if you haven't seen it to drive by and hopefully pause and, and, and get out of your cars and take a look. But I kept pausing over and coming back to the, the sole black and white image that was available. It was partially because I tend to collect outlier images. Yet the image connected with me and ultimately the one I brought home where it's sort of Mona Lisa smile and fabulous hat hair or hair of hat is the first thing I see every morning. Why this piece? It was the piece that reminded me of my mother. Um, if you can click again, please, Michelle. Thank you. It was the piece that reminded me of my mother in her pre black is beautiful Afro days, which came a few years later in the 1970s. There's something that I find nostalgic, whimsical, and connected to an earlier black politics that I have studied but didn't know, didn't personally know, of marching in suits, protest sit-ins and kitten heels, of the fire hoses that laid waste to the carefully hot ironed hair. 
Ebony documented all of this. And since the Ar Simpsons archive gives us a way of re-experiencing this common genealogical tree of visual rep representation, one in which generations of black folk can locate ourselves wherever we encountered it. In addition to this genealogical tree, I was, I'm sorry. Um, uh, in the sense that we all grew up with not only these common visual vet references, but with a common narrative of black life that Ebony and Jet provided. Thank you, Adrienne. Uh, thank you so much for your very personal story and sharing your beautiful Lorna work with us. And thank you for sharing your beautiful puffs with us tonight too. Um, you can feel the power. I am going to call in next our, um, our wonderful Raven Raj Loy to be our next contributor. Raven is an assistant professor at Washington University in St. Louis. Her research focuses on digital media and critical race studies, particularly the intersections between race, gender, and digital media culture. She's currently working on her first book, Reshaping Black Resistance, which explores the shifting nature of Black resistance strategies, from, uh, strategies online from care and means to networks of care. Mirage Loy comes to St. Louis from Gonzaga University in Washington State. She's originally from Negril, Jamaica, and enjoys internet memes, reality television, and playing with her very active two-year-old. Thank you, Raven, for being here. Thank you so much. I am going to share my screen. Wow, Dr. Davis, that was tough to follow. That was beautiful, both Dr. Books um, uh, and Dr. Cooks. Wow. Uh, Dr. Davis, Dr. Cooks. That was amazing. Um, okay, so I would like to begin, I think. I have my screen. Excuse me one second. I'm going to share again. Let's see here. I always joke that I'm a digital media scholar and there's always something when it comes to digital media. Okay. Here we are. Let's try this again. Okay, um, I'd like to thank, thanks for bearing with me there. I'd like to thank the Contemporary Art Museum and the Center for Race and Ethnicity for organizing this truly wonderful event and for inviting me to contribute. So um, for me, growing up in the 90s, I don't remember Ebony and Jet not being a part of my life. As magazines founded 40 plus years prior, they simply were embedded into my daily routines, recycled and tattered as they were for me in what we would say rural Jamaica. Um, so it's interesting that Dr. Cooks mentioned the diaspora of, of Blackness. So I hope to shed some light there. Uh, whether I was at the hairdresser, waiting in the doctor's office, or visiting my favorite aunt, Ebony in particular was an aesthetic symbol of Black excellence across the diaspora and specifically in the U.S., um, both in the everyday and in the spectacular. So I want to talk this evening very briefly about the digital shift of the magazines, not um, from print itself, but to social media. Given, of course, the short time that we have, I'll focus my attention on Ebony Magazine. So Ebony's Instagram went live in 2011, um, only a year after the platform Instagram itself was created. 
As a magazine known for its prowess in capturing the diverse aesthetics of blackness from our hair to the layered meanings of our smiles, Ebony, Ebony's Instagram presence as a largely visual platform took off. Moving from traditional magazine on a coffee table, Ebony's social media presence gave my circle of friends and I, by that time in our 20s, inspiration about beauty, legislative possibilities, and even content creation. So the first picture you see here is um, Ebony describing the Crown Act, for example, right? So talking about natural hair um, in legislation, and which has been a, a huge topic of conversation for, for decades. Um, the site easily flows between past and present issues, rooting millennials and Gen Z social media users, like many of my students, um, in the long trajectory of Black storytelling. That's ludicrous if anybody doesn't know. He doesn't look like ludicrous there, but it is. Um, the immense power of agency in doing so eventually led me to decide on magazine journalism for my undergraduate and graduate degrees, though my career trajectories have taken a slightly different route as an assistant professor at WashU. Digital media scholars like myself write about the intimate and performative possibilities of Instagram, particularly for Black archival purposes. So right now I'm writing a chapter of the book on Black digital archiving of Juneteenth, and I follow four Black historians um, and discuss the ways in which they archive Juneteenth um, and the ways that they borrow from past resistance strategies like um, uh, the performative, oral, memoir, and of course, Black art, right? Um, because outlets like Ebony and Jet, oops, sorry y'all, here we go. Okay. Um, because outlets like Ebony and Jet have been painstakingly detailing the intimate and artistic as a means of showing our humanity, one might consider the impact of these magazines, not just on individual or communal lives, but to the culture of digital media itself. Um, that is, one might argue, as I and others in the field do, that Black content creators from TikTok dancers to Yes, Jet and Ebony um, shape the cultural and material developments of multi-million dollar social network sites like Instagram through long-worn long modes of archival performances, aesthetic creations, linguistics like signifying and more. So um, before hashtag Black Excellence and Black Girl Magic trended across our various platforms, which are both incredible in their own right, there was Ebony and there was Jet, consistently highlighting pleasures and pains of Black folks, giving a girl in Jamaica and a host of other girls and women like me ideas of radical possibilities of existence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raven. Thank you, I really appreciate you giving us uh, that, that perspective um, and pulling us out to the global as well. And I believe last, but absolutely certainly not least, we have Professor, Professor Christopher Tinzen is going to join us. Um, so I'd like to call him into the space. Um, Professor Tinzen is the chair of African American the African American Studies Department and an associate professor in history at St. Louis University. His teaching and research focuses on the histories of Africana race, ra ra ah, sorry. His teaching and research focuses on the histories of Africana radical traditions, black protest movements, US ethnic studies, incarceration and race and sports. He is the author of the book entitled Radical Intellect, Liberator Magazine and Black Activism in the 1960s, and his writings and reviews have been published very widely. Thank you for being with us, Professor Tinzen. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I hope to not keep people too long because I know we want to have a nice dialogue with the community here. Um, I want to just salute all the presenters right before me, learned a ton, um, and those are some gems that you guys presented, so I, I really appreciate 
being here and seeing your work um, and seeing the beauty of it and being reminded of the beauty of Ebony Magazine as well. Um, so, all right, so I'm gonna share a screen if I can. Let's see, all right. Um, so I wanted to do something where we kind of look back and, and see kind of the world that Ebony inherited as well, okay? So part of Ebony's magic, if you will, is to kind of rule out all the other kind of cultural presentations. And they took up such a space that we forget that there was a large tradition of media publications and um, in, in print culture in black community. Um, so what I want to do was start with um, a quick look back at some of the early examples of Black, um, I will say, publications that helped form a Black public or a Black political public. Um, Crisis Magazine coming out of the NAACP in 1910, um, Opportunity out of the Urban League. These are all early 20th century publications um, because Ebony appears in the post-war period, and that's very significant for where Black people were, particularly in the United States at that, that particular time. Crusader Magazine, uh, also of the 20s. The Messenger, A. Philip Randolph, who was a, a chief architect of the early uh, March on Washington movement of the 1940s, worked very closely with Bayard Rustin. Um, we forget about the Negro world, Marcus Garvey um, and the UNIA. Another one that was international, and I'm glad we, my colleagues are talking about the international dimension and diasporic dimensions, the International African Opinion was by a group of expats uh, from the Caribbean who were in London organizing for Black independence on the continent. There was a Crusader magazine that was a magazine newsletter that was presented by or created by Robert F. Williams, um, who was one of the chief architects of the violent resistance to white supremacy um, in Monroe, North Carolina, which got him expelled from the NAACP. Um, and then there's more kind of religious politics um, that we have to think about as well. When we think about Bahamic Speaks, um, started in the 1960s, Freedom Ways Journal on, on the left in the 1960s as well, affiliated with the CPUSA. Um, and here is the world that kind of um, Johnson enters. Um, his magazine, his work is in conversation with these other journals that also emerge in large and small spaces. Not all of these journals were as in dialogue as Ebony and Jet. And that's because of the, the politics, if you will, of capital and the advertising dollars that John H. Johnson relied on in order to make that glossy magazine that we all keep our, our journey on. And I think that that's an important piece to really think about the political economy of the magazine. Um, and so Negro Digest actually predated, um, predated uh, Ebony. That was his first four-way. And shortly thereafter, he created Ebony, but it re really wasn't his anchor just yet. Later on, he would um, convert this magazine into the Black world, and it would succeed for a few more years before going out. Other, other, other publications, in particular my work, really looks at this magazine, The Liberator, which was published for a decade from 1960 to 1971 out of New York. But then we have to also think about the print culture shaped by the Black Panther Party, both in aesthetics and politics um, and a radical vision for a transformed society. And so here's a couple of images from the Black Panther newspaper. And there's Mr. Johnson. Um, Mr. Johnson was foremost a businessman, but he also loved Black culture. But he understood that in order to be successful, one had to be successful with a business mind, and some would argue with the capitalist mind, to really see how many um, dollars he could recruit, but also not totally sell out Black folks at the same time. I feel, in my interpretation, that was the line that he was trying to straddle. I think he was very successful with that because you can't have anything last for 50 years without a smart, savvy navigation system. And I think that Johnson understood the marketplace in ways that many other publications um, did not or could not compete. Um, and so he was able to amass a lot of power in that regard. And it really led to a lot of successful other ventures that he developed. 
One of the things that um, we have to think about is also who contributed to the content, but also the, the presentation of the magazine. And so um, some of my research looks at a man by the name of Lerone Bennett. And Lerone Bennett was an associate editor um, for over 40 years. He recently passed in 2018. And um, I'm just showing images that we more familiar with from Ebony Magazine. There's Lerone Bennett at the desk at the Ebony office in Chicago. Um, and I point these early images out or of the magazines because that's the kind of middle class perspective, a particular kind of gloss beauty, as my colleagues have already talked about, um, that the magazine was known for. And Bennett's uh, goal was to really try to shift or at least add to or complement this kind of desire with an understanding of the kind of political histories and social histories of African-Americans. And so he was pretty much the social historian of the magazine. And he actually impacted the magazine more than we can think about um, when we think about issues like this that we don't really readily come to mind when we think about Ebony Magazine, which um, because of his relationship with Johnson, Lerone Bennett was able to uh, really impact the magazine in this regard. Here's a picture from the 1960s, 1967 Fist Conference in Tennessee. And I love this image. It wasn't in Ebony. But it's an image because it shows a kind of a broad sweep of black culture and black arts. Um, here, left to right, is Margaret Danner, John O. Killens, obviously, you know, Gwendolyn Brooks. To her left is Leroy Jones, aka Mary Baraka. Behind him is John Henry Clark. To his left is Ron Milner, a playwright out of Detroit. And there's Ben sitting right next to them. And so, this is the kind of coterie of folks that we think about when we think about black culture, black arts. This was the kind of political and literary and cultural world of Ebony Magazine, in fact. Um, not pictured, and I want to say he probably took this picture, was Hoyt Fuller. And Hoyt Fuller was the lead convener of the Fisk Conference that drew these writers together. And of course, Hoyt Fuller was the longtime editor of the Black world. And so Johnson, while he wasn't the most political person, um, definitely allowed the space of politics and an assertive kind of black radicalism to also take center stage in Ebony Magazine, known for high art, known for um, middle-class aspiration as, we, as we've already identified. Um, and, and so in that regard, it's, it's a very important, and I would say a complicated magazine, in fact, if we think about all the kinds of different work that it's doing for us, uh, with us, with our permission, and sometimes not. Um, but at the same time, trying to give a sense of Black beauty, Black possibility, um, and a Black political imaginary. So I'll stop there, and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tenzin, so much for the historical perspective uh, and context on um, the publishers. And also thank you for building on, I would like to also just say what a wonderful lineup of scholars and professors that we have across the board that are able to give us such um, complex, rich histories in accessible, exciting, really, um, really available ways. So thank you all for who have um, spoken so far. I don't believe that she was able to join us, but I'm just doing a double check to see if Danielle Brown is in the room. And if not, uh, this is the part where I would like to call in anybody that would like to share their voice um, and response to what does Ebony and Jet mean to you. You can also use this as a chance to keep a dialogue going with any of our speakers. To do that, you can raise your hand using the reactions button. Um, that will let us know that we should spotlight you so that everyone can see you and at least hear your voice. Um, see if you'd like to come on camera or hear your voice. And while people are ruminating on questions or thinking about what they'd like to say, I'm gonna go back to the playlist that I would have been playing. Oh, actually I won't. Yolanda, I see you there. And I invite you to come into the space and share your voice. 
Hi, now I just had a question. I mean, these, these talks were just so generative and, and wonderful and I'm just so excited and bubbling. So I don't wanna to take too much time, but I just had a, a two quick questions for, for the panel, for anyone who wants to answer. Um, the first is kind of Ebony's, as you all have talked about, kind of modes of presentation and respectability and middle-class sensibility. And I'm curious if any of you remember Ebony Man, which came out, I wanna say in the eighties, and it, it, it had this, it, you know, it was this own kind of glossy magazine that kind of focused on black masculinity. And I'm curious kind of why in that moment you think and kind of what you think that that brought to the, the Ebony fam magazine family. And then the second thing that I just had to ask for any of the panel was, you know, we talked about like fashion and glitz and glamour and imagery, but I also want to get your take on how that leapt out of the magazine for Ebony in the sense that they had these Ebony fashion tours that were nationwide, right? And then fashion fair makeup, right? Became, was featured prominently in the magazine as, as a space for black women to find shades and colors that, you know, were difficult to find before beforehand. And so those were just my two quick thoughts and I'd love for anyone to answer that. Uh, Yolanda, thank you for that, because that brought up a memory I haven't had in a long time. We did not have Ebony Man in my house <laughs> that I knew of. I was wondering if there was a relationship between Ebony Man and Black Enterprise, because I feel like I remember them kind of emerging at the same time. And Christopher might know, um, and I appreciate it so much that look back, look Black. Um, and uh, to look at that context, it's an intellectual history and it's a business history um, and an activist history. So it's interesting uh, to think about a magazine that's focused on black men that isn't primarily about sexuality. Um, I don't know, I mean, I think about, um, yeah, image, uh, magazines that instead are looking at black men as leaders, you know, um, and so I don't know, I was thinking uh, maybe someone else on the panel would have something more to say, but I did just want to say, yes, I remembered it. And it also had a strong uh, fashion element too, Ebony Man did. It like, did, I just pulled up some covers. At, at Boys to Men is on the cover of one, John Singleton is on a cover of one. So, you know, they're well-dressed and we used to play this game in the backyard where it was like, you could be an Ebony model and you'd always have to have like a watch you know, and you like strike a pose and like do your different things. And there was like an ebony persona and we knew what it was, you know, it was a particular kind of look. So I agree, um, business and fashion, I think, um, but I'm sure there are many people who know uh, better than I do about this. Yeah, I'm, I didn't have Ebony Man, but I do remember seeing it. And, um, but, you know, about the beauty piece, one of the things we could think about is that there was a time where actually black communities protested Ebony because it ran this issue on the cover it said, are Negro girls getting prettier? And of course, black community was like, we're not having this. Is this a black magazine? Now you're peddling in white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Now you're peddling in white, white beauty standards. And so from that moment, I believe that's 66. From that moment, you start to see well more diversity, well more diversity of Black women's images on the magazine cover. And so that's a really, it's an interesting turning point because I think Johnson um, had kind of got ahead of himself or maybe revealed too much of himself or just wasn't checking and wrote and, and went with his cover story, Are Negro Girls Getting Prettier, which is just absurd. So there was a protest at the New York office and at the Chicago office. And then from that point, uh, Black people were calling for Ebony to go away. And he pivoted and started to show more diversity um, from there on out. So I just wanted to add that piece too. Wow. I'll add really quickly, you know, Yolanda, and I also want to welcome Yolanda to St. Louis. Um, so it's great to have you over at St. Louis University. And I can't wait to see you when this madness is over. You just called to mind a memory I had completely forgotten, but it's it's an important thing. So yes, um, middle-class Black women, and for all I know, all Black women, I don't know, but, but middle-class Black women hosted Ebony Fashion Fair fashion shows, because I remember, I, I've so suppressed this memory. 
being compelled to be in one of those fashion shows at one of my mother's friend's house. I, oh my God, I'm, I'm, I'm just mortified even thinking about it. Right. But it was sort of almost like a Tupperware party. Right. Um, but, but very much about, um, you know, black women being together in, um, in community around a kind of both visual consumption, right? And also, you know, of course, um, a literal consumption um, as, as well. And I had completely forgotten about that. And, and recently I saw something, I wish I could remember who wrote it, about how we overlook uh, Eunice Johnson's, right, importance yeah. as a businesswoman and her own role in um, the development of fashion and her insistence on a kind of a respect that she would bring when she traveled to the fashion shows abroad and everything. And so I don't think that we give yeah. enough credit to some of that intersectionality around um, around Ebony and the Johnson publishing empire more, more broadly. So thank you for that, that question. Thank you. Adrian was my former professor at UNC Law School, so I'm so excited to see her. <laughs> I'm so excited to see one of my students with, a, with a, a great, great old job over at St. Louis University. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm kind of leaving you on the hook, Yolanda, because I'm hoping that someone else will come in. Yes. Hello. Is that my mother? Is that, okay. Hello. Okay. Hello. Hi. Come on Hi. in. Um, I'm a guest of Roz Norman. My name is Chester A. Deans Jr. And um, this whole presentation is so spectacular because it really just uh, brings a total perspective of how the Jet and Ebony magazine kind of enlighten us, whether it be from the perspective of Professor Tenson or Bridget Cooks or Adrian Davis. But at the same time, um, with the fashion fair component, it promoted some of the, shall we say, exquisite fashions that Black Americans have and we had a show here in St. Louis called the St. Louis Sentinel Cherry Shows. And I was a major model and producer in those shows as well as HBC. So I was just, like I said, just sitting here in the artistic perspective and the historical perspective. And Tenson, you know, you, you hit the revolutionary thing right on point, man. Because I still struggle with that with some of the students at a school that I work in called Warbridge. And it's hard to get them engaged into history because as you all had already stated, they didn't grow up with that kind of history. So we have to continue to put it before them. So I wanna thank you very much, Cam, and everyone that put this together. Yolanda Wilson, your, your, your question was right on point. So thank you very much. It's just my small input. And thank you, Roz, for inviting me. And I also I saw Renee on, and uh, Patricia Thurman on the on the chat here. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Okay. I don't have to. Can we call on my mother? <laughs> <laughs> Am I, can you hear me? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay, so now you'll learn why Adrian is the rebel that she is. And Christopher <laughs> raised an issue about, uh, there was a period of time when people were protesting because um, Mr. Johnson was saying are African-American women getting prettier. Now, I don't know what, uh, what time period that there was, Christopher, but here's where Adrian gets the radicalism from. From my perspective, which no one has talked about, there was a period at what are now, our, well, they always were, our historically black universities, colleges, where the homecoming queen was a certain complexion. And it was not until I think the 60s when they began to have women who had a brown complexion that were um, homecoming queens. So I was wondering whether all of these eras were coming together where we were as African-Americans beginning to appreciate our hair. And I'm sorry that Adrian did not show you a picture of me with the huge Afro 
where I look like an older Angela Davis, okay? And I actually, as a former community activist, I am appalled that you go away thinking that I was that person that you saw and that you never saw the real deal. Okay, so anyway, uh, maybe Christopher can talk about the, um, whether that era that he talked about where you had the protest because of the, um, you know, the comment about um, our, our African-American women getting pretty, if you could talk about that. And the other question I have or comment I had is that I went to those fashion shows, but I never felt that they represented clothes that I could wear or that would have been appropriate for me. All right, so those are two ideas that I would like for you to explore. And I loved, I loved the speakers. Now, <laughs> I know you all think that I'm- Okay, mommy, it's time to wrap up. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, I am. Uh, okay. I know you all think that I'm prejudiced and, and that I would say that Avian was the best speaker, but she was pretty high up there, okay. No, no, none of us could trump the fact that you guys were in the magazine. None of right. us could say that, right? None of us could say that. Um, so I know I would, I would be more interested in just knowing that day, like when the photographers came to your house and took the picture. You know, I'm, I, I would like to go into that. I mean, you don't have to, but you know, I think that one of the issues that um, we always struggle with was, you know, when you when we live under a society which has, you know, debased our humanity told us that we weren't beautiful, you know, you have to kind of reverse it 180. And so um, that's kind of been our story, right? And it lends itself to, as you know, scholars um, have, have brilliantly written to a politics of respectability and it can lead to that, right? But it's not only that. So I think that there's some, um, we get something from these images. And I, and I think that even the people who are, who are more politically minded or saying revolutionary minded, they're also getting something from these images as well. And it's not only a negative, it's also affirmation, but I think that there's always been a, a way in which black people have always clamored for diversity of representation um, and have had very limited control over that historically. And so when we get opportunities to control it, I think that it bothered the public of the night, some publics of the 1960s, that it will conform, that a black owned magazine will conform to standards that denigrated blackness, right? And so that it was entrapped in that. Not to say that that was Johnson's full embodiment, but that would, it, it was part of that, um, those trappings. And so I think that that's the piece that, that they pushed back on Ebony for. I think people didn't want Ebony to necessarily go away but I think that they definitely wanted it to change its tune vis-a-vis -vis the diversity of, of Black representation. And I, and I love your, your point about the um, homecoming queens. I think a lot of that, you know, one of my good uh, friends, Tanisha Ford, has written about um, the Grandasa models and all the kind of beauty uh, uh, politics and cultural politics and aesthetic practices and politics that occurred from the 1950s to the 1970s. So, you know, you lived it. You know, I'm just I'm just a historian who's reading the archive, and so you lived it. So I'm never going to tell you uh, what it was, but I, I appreciate you you uh, chiming in on that. Thank you. Okay. If no one else wants to talk, I'll tell you, uh, Christopher, exactly what my reaction was on the day that we were interviewed and uh, photographed for that story. Um, and, and mommy, can you give the brief version? Because someone else does have their hand up. So the- oh, okay, the I brief, didn't know. The brief, well, no, I, I know, will, I know, the brief version. I will yield to that person. I will yield to that person. She's okay? a lawyer. <laughs> You're leaving us in suspense. We would love a sound, at least a sound bite. Okay, quickly. I come home from a full day at law school. The kids come to the door, to, you know, Adrian and Cheryl, and Cheryl's on this also. They come to the door. Daddy's looking for you. He's going to bring a reporter. 
And I'm what? And when I opened the door, so I made everybody get dressed up pretty, right? And um, made the house look nice and neat. And when I opened the door, there was a photographer and a reporter. And the, and the reporter said, turned to my husband and he said, meaning me, she doesn't look so tough. So that was, <laughs> that was what my husband had said to this reporter. The other thing is, it was a complete shock to me that Ebony Magazine would want to do a story on an FBI agent. Because you can imagine that in the 80s, being an FBI agent was not popular. Okay, and you have to applaud my daughter for the way she has brought her life together in spite of having a father who was an FBI agent, okay? <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Ms. Lawrence. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, I am calling in Carlton to add your voice. Good evening to everyone. It was a beautiful presentation. Uh, I loved it. I wanted to definitely do it in person, but Mother Nature did not contribute to us. But, but anyway, uh, uh, I just like to say John H. Johnson was my hero. I have a degree in journalism. If you, publish, if you study publishing and journalism and things like that, he is one of the great American publishers. Uh, I like to also talk about how, you know, his entrepreneurship. I mean, here's a guy that started with a $500 loan against his mother's furniture and ended up with a building on Michigan Avenue. Matter of fact, it's the only building on Michigan Avenue that has a driveway because Mayor Daly gave him a special exemption so he can drive up and go straight up to his office. So the guy is, uh, like I say, my hero. But one of the things and what I'm going to mention is that I don't think he gets credit for the economic contribution he has made. And by that, I mean, here's a guy in many ways, shapes or fashion, created the black consumer market. And he created the black consumer market because white folks wouldn't advertise with him. So he had to bring together all the goods, the products and services in the black community and say, hey, we got money. We got money. And uh, um, not to belabor the point, but I saw an interview with him years ago, and he said that the black consumer in America is the profit margin of America. And by that, he meant that at that time, he took the Fortune 500 companies, their profit was about $368 billion. And uh, if you do the same thing today, our $1.5 trillion economy, in many ways, shapes, or fashion, is that. Uh, uh, profit margin, because as you look at the commercials that you see today, if you don't have the black consumer, you don't make a profit. If you don't have the black folks in your Democratic Party, Republican Party, you don't make a profit. So I give him credit for that. And I just like to say that uh, uh, not only I like what uh, Persephone Davis talked about, his wife, Eunice, I mean, uh, uh, that was a beautiful, beautiful situation whereby what the models went through could not wear the clothes. You could not walk on stage and things of that nature. And then with the uh, Ebony fashion show. So I just like to just say that from my standpoint as a business person, I just love the uh, um, economic impact of Ebony Magazine and, and what the Johnson Publishing Empire did. And I just think it's a, almost a tragedy that it does not exist today. Thanks to everyone. Like I said, it was a beautiful presentation. I, Glad I woke up to get it. <laughs> Thank you for that, Mr. Jones. Thank you. Bridget, can I pass the word to you as we start to close down the night? Uh, yes, this is something that I just wanted to mention. I meant to say it earlier. I just put a link in the chat for people who want to read about this, but um, I'm on a uh, a board at the Getty Research Institute, which is the African American Art History Initiative Board. And in uh, 2019, um, the Getty Research Institute and the Smithsonian, the Blacksonian, the National African American Museum of History and Culture, um, 
and the Ford Foundation um, and the Mellon Foundation all put their money together, $30 million of it, to purchase the Johnson Publishing Archive. So for people who want to do research, this is a, a major, major step in, in terms of um, preservation and conservation and also digitizing the archives. And it's not just Ebony and Jet, it's, it's you know, I don't know if any of us, and maybe there are some can name all of the, the different magazines. Some of them were very short lived um, and then some, you know, lasted quite a while, but all of those archives um, have been purchased. It's a enormous project to digitize it and make it available, but it will be made available at, um, these different locations around the country. So just to um, keep your eye out for that if you're interested um, in future research for yourself or your students in particular. Bridget, that is amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And thank you for doing that work. That's incredible. Yeah, I, Laron Brooks, Laron Brooks is the <laughs> Uh, assistant curator at the uh, Getty Research Institute who really helped us to make sure this happened. It was a collaborative effort, but um, my understanding is as soon as people knew it was available, the phone calls on the weekends and at late night, it was like, we have to do this, let's get together. And they got $30 million together. That's great. Can I jump? I just want to address um, uh, something Mr. Jones brilliantly uh, raised. And, and just to give John is Johnson his, his flowers for that entrepreneurial spirit to that point, he wasn't just concerned with the magazine, but he also helped, JPC actually published books as well. And so there was a whole book series that they published that were supposed to go in libraries. Um, they, like I said, they wanted to do an encyclopedia. Uh, they had, they'd done several, him and Bennett had done several um, anthologies of key articles that were published in Ebony. Um, I'm holding one here. This is Lerone Bennett's The Challenge of Blackness. And many of the essays um, in this book actually were started in Ebony Magazine. And most of us know Lerone Bennett from his 1962 classic Before the Mayflower, an early history of African-Americans in the diaspora. Um, the, the early goings of that were published in Ebony before they became a book that became a staple in black studies. And just to tie a bow on it, Lerone Bennett helped found the Northwestern University Black Studies Department. He was one of his early directors and chairs. Um, and he also went to the blessing of the Cornell University, Africana University Center, where they were starting black studies um, in the late 60s and 70s. So Lerone Bennett, John H. Johnson, multi-level contributions to Black life, culture, politics, and education. So I just want to salute um, Mr. Jones for his point and, and just give you that on, on Mr. Bennett and Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Chris. And I'll, um, I would love to keep going. I know there was a chat, a question in the chat from Dr. Roz Norman asking how can Ebony engage or connect with today's classism within the Black community? I'm taking all of this and the, the, the rain and the storm outside as clear signs that we all are due a rain check to gather again and keep the conversation going. <laughs> and with that, I say a huge thank you to Hetty, Johnny and Tila at CRE2, especially Tila who helped me keep my cool and was DJ behind the scenes with me tonight. Um, thank you to Misa who gave us the presentation on Lorna's work. Please do come see it before it goes down next at the end of next week. Um, a big thank you to our incredible uh, scholars, thinkers, creators who are on the call with us tonight. Thank you to Professor Raven Mirage Lloyd. Thank you to Professor Christopher Tinzen. Thank you to Professor Adrian Davis. A huge thank you to Professor Bridget Cooks for making the trip to St. Louis and for just being all around wonderful. Um, and thank you to all of you for coming and participating. The conversation continues. We appreciate you all so much. Stay safe, stay warm, to be continued. Good night. Good night, everyone. Bye, Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Good night, Mommy. <laughs> oh, yes. And of course, to the to the actual star of the show, we say thank That's you right. to Adrienne's mo mother. That's thank right. you for being here. <laughs> She's in Philadelphia. I'm in St. Louis. So <laughs> amazing. Bye.